Back in my The Batman vs Dracula video, I said that the then upcoming My Adventures with Superman show would be a rehash of better things done before. For which at least one commentator called me out as I had written, recorded and edited that part of the video before the show had even come out. With that hindsight, I decided to do what I have learned how to do with animated properties and so recorded myself watching all 10 episodes of the show as it was coming out with varying reactions. To eat all ready to go. <laughs> Why? Wow! Hey! Stealth is a negative. <laughs> it's a broom closet. <laughs> Are you f***ing kidding me? Ron Troop gets gender pet. Which it doesn't. I fucked it. Where the hell did the planet star be? Oh, this is so green. Okay. Ready to go. Did they race, Ben Lloyd? Oh my god, they're recycling that throw. Wait, what? Oh, this is still another story we have seen and heard before. I couldn't even get any new ground, please. Something new. Superman, stop the bus. Where were we? Wow, yes, I don't. There's a mugging on 47. Cream cheese. Boy, here right you are. This is so. Superman oh. had that, that would work better like if the Superman was yep. older and more seasoned, or anyhow, Clark. Or like that, like, like, like this, you uh, this young. Thing, this maybe, tech, if so Superman is this young, this can show up and ask questions himself. Uh, I'm not letting you out of my sight. Okay, so this is the. Controversy or controversy that, that that people were complaining about. This is why this was supposed to should have happened later in life and not this early. But hey, ten ten episode series. They, they needed to. They had to condense it oh, this much. Those were my initial reactions while I was watching my adventures with Superman. And overall, you should be able to get the idea on how I was not very positive on them. Some time has passed since then, as I was also busy working on these other videos while the episodes were coming out, so I have calmed down from those initial viewings and given those 10 episodes some more thought. I'll so try to keep my feelings about it balanced and as unbiased as they were when I did my scene by scene unbiased review on Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice the Ultimate Edition. Before we start, let me get this obligatory rant out of the way. Why did this have to be yet another young slash early career Superman story after that Superboy show that came in the late 1980s, the Lois and Clark show that was in the early 1990s, Superman the Animated Series from the late 1990s, Smallville from the 2000s, and finally Man of Steel. That era of Superman's career has been covered more than enough in making most of what happens in those shows just get to the point where we are now in the current comics, which then leads to speedy catch up that end up costing character development that those previous shows had. To summarize, it would have made more sense to have this show be set later into Superman's career, like how the Battle of the Super Sons movie and the Superman and Lois TV show did. And with that out of the way, I should now be able to talk about my adventures with Superman on its own merits without any excessive comparisons to past medias. Okay, as the sixth early career Superman show, the new angle that they did for it was to make the Superman's Kryptonian heritage vague and obscure to the point where Superman himself doesn't know what he is or how he is different, and the AI Jor-El speaks that same Kryptonese that Supergirl did in her post-crisis debut. Also, Kryptonite won't get introduced until the season finale, and even that ends up breaking some rules. More about that later, but Clark Kent is mostly kept as the default personality for Superman, with his development as a character unfortunately ending up coming across as something of a flanderized parody of the pre-crisis Clark Kent disguise persona. For which we can thank his interactions with the show's versions of Superman's supporting characters, who are reimagined either as composites with other characters, some completely separate characters, or as anime stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. 
Jimmy Olsen has been merged with the Smallville's version of Pete Ross to have been Clark's friend from an earlier point in his life, as well as been pretty much dead along with Perry White, who is used so sparingly in this show that it might as well be the bare minimum before he would start to act out of character. And when it comes to that reference I made, race bending two originally white characters would have probably gotten inoffensively ignored or given a pass by most people if they had left well enough alone and kept Ron through the same. But instead he ended up going through transitioning from Ron to Ronnie behind the scenes. It is not confirmed in there, but this could be the show's first unintentional trans character. Meanwhile, Lois Lane is DAs from a professional season reporter into a hyperactive intern reporter at the Daily Planet when Clark and Jimmy also apply for a job there. This change becomes something of a frustrating detail when the Superman sandbox is broken in the 8th episode, where Vicky Vale is pulled over from the Batman sandbox and designed to look like an older version of Lois Lane, which also happens to be her fourth hair color by the way. Actually, the sandboxes are broken rather early on in the two-parter pilot episode, or the first two episodes that came out together, where Superman's rogues gallery is first started out with this technology-based slash powered version of Livewire, and is then led to who is confirmed to be an another Deathstroke impersonator. I'm calling him that, because those other two characters with him are confirmed to be General Sam Lane and Amanda Waller, which so rebrands the pre-existing Superman Revenge Squad into another version of the Suicide Squad as Task Force X. Also, the real Deathstroke and Sam Lane in the comics are supposed to be close to same age, who served together in the military. So, if a younger soldier was needed to serve under General Lane as his right hand, they should have just used Metal as John Corbin was retconned in Jeff Chan's 2009 Superman Secret Origin Story into a US sergeant serving under General Sam Lane's command. The rest of the formerly known as the Superman Revenge Squad is formed by a seriously downgraded version of the Inter Gang, who instead of being an organized crime faction in the Metropolis criminal underworld, is here reduced into a gang of misfits led by Silver Banshee, who might as well be an another conveyor belt produced variant of Livewire, or in layman's terms, Silver Banshee is another tech-based villain rather than a Gaelic spirit-based slash inspired metahuman. And that parking bin version of Intergang also has a character who was named as Mick Rory aka Heatwave, so we have a Flash villain taken from his roles into this Superman show. And then there is Parasite, who is for some reason made out to be the consequence aftermath of Amazo not working, and so instead of Raymond Jensen, Rudy Jones, Alex and Alexandra Alston or Joshua Allen, Professor Ivo is now Parasite in this show. And if you have seen the animated Man of Tomorrow movie from 2020, you have seen this version of Parasite before. Professor Ivo, on the other hand, I could see him as an XP for Lex Luthor, who is allowed to take more punishment as an XP for Lex Luthor, while starting out from a somewhat similar place. As a handsome slash charismatic billionaire tech giant, who after an incident involving Superman, then caused him to end up getting bold, or in the this case is figured and then blame Superman for all of it. There's Superman, a guy who claims he just wants to help. But can we really trust a stranger to help us for free? Please, this man needs your help. You ruined me. What's your angle? What's in this for you? Dr. Ivo, look around you. Is it that hard to believe that some people just want to help? Same thing. To take down Superman. To rip him from the sky and to bury him so deep the world won't even remember his name. <laughs> yeah, no, in that case, I can work with all of this. Did you really think you could ruin my life without any consequences? <laughs> I told you. 
Superman. This ends when I'm dead! Hurt me? Well, the only reason you won last time is because you cheated! You don't hurt me! I hurt you! And I my own fault for doing what I did! The people of this city, or anyone, ever again. You aren't the hero here! I am not you. even you are human! Yourself. You turned me into a monster! It's never my own fault for doing what I did! And then, after the Teen Titans villain and a Flash villain, the rule of three is brought into a full circle when episode 6 has the Brain and Monsieur Mala brought over from Doom Patrol, who are probably used here just so we could see an interspecies gay relationship. Cowards, own up to your changes! Those are some things I feel obligated to criticize my adventures with Superman for, because they come across as changes made for the sake of having the show stand out from its predecessors, but taking it a couple of steps too far. Then there are the necessary recreations slash retellings of certain key moments that stand out like a sore thumb, but can in my case also come across as your mileage may vary issue, which in this case is the Lois and Clark relationship. That relationship's portrayal in this show comes, well, to me at least, as something that was rushed into too soon with a true fragile foundation under it, with the inevitable secret identity reveal being done in the middle of this first season, as if to get it over with out of the fear of the show getting cancelled too soon. As an actual personal reference, I am comfortable enough to admit, Smallville along with the Lois and Clark show did it with better build up, where Lois's initial Superman-focused journalistic pursuit either mellowed down to make her notice Clark, or as her finding out about it on her own and waiting for him to tell her when he was ready. My adventures with Superman decided to go with the latter option as early as the fifth episode, which with this version of Lois being written as she is, her reaction in confirming that Clark is Superman being a mix of feelings betrayed and entitled to have been told early makes her come across worse than if this was done in a later season episode. The fact that their relationship is rushed over to this point this fast essentially makes it an another case of the story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story. And I don't mean to sound like Jared when talking about Lois Lane. Here's why I think that Lois Lane adds zero things to Superman. Because ultimately, she's just there to be the damsel in distress. You could say they've tried to take her out of that. But they failed repeatedly. Like the uh, Greg Rucka series on Lois Lane failed miserably. And here's here's the thing though, his fans want her to be the one that Superman saves. But the seventh episode of this show ended up making me see her the same way as Jared does. In it, we get the multiverse subbed into it along with a uh, Mr. Mixia Spitlick, who by this design could have been Vindictivx from Grant Morrison's New 52 Action Comics Run 2. And then there is this interdimensional league of Loises, all of whom are just variations of this show's main Lois, and one of them claims that this show is set on Earth 12. Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen of Earth 12, you need to come with us. Well, what? that claim is however disproven when this same episode attempts to pull off mythology nods to previous Superman medias and showcase both the DCAU Superman and the DCAU Lois in it, because in case you didn't know, Earth 12 is the DC animated universe where Superman the animated series took place in. Literally, the only thing this episode got right was that Earth 14 is an atomic wasteland. In the end, the one thing I found interesting in this show was the reinvention of Superman's Kryptonian heritage, and how it has been kept vague enough that Superman himself doesn't have a clear picture of it to the point where he doesn't like the little tidbits that he has learned. As I previously mentioned, the AI Jor-El speaks in Kryptonies of which Superman is not fluent in, but he was still somehow able to speak both Kryptonies and English in the season finale. Ever. 
Filo va comprar. Kalel, tu falar. Valu, rapide. Kalel, my son. Then there is the visual evidence of how Superman's ship is larger than in the previous Superman medias, and it came to Earth almost the same way how Superboy Prime did. The show this way implies of a different kind of status quo for Krypton, along with the reasons that led to Superman being sent to Earth through what looks like an interdimensional portal where an invasion force was attempting to come out from, and what General Lane was there to witness as a young man to inspire him to create the rebranded Superman Revenge Squad in the form of Task Force X. That is something I recognize both as an intriguing new take on the Superman lore, but also as something of a head-scratcher that makes me doubt that this could have originally been a show about something else that was then rewritten as a Superman show for a better market recognition. If that latter one turns out to be true, then that could explain why most of the Superman aspects were skipped over in a rushed fashion, and Kryptonite, now that I get to talk about it, is then only brought up from the League of Loises episode as being from another universe in the multiverse, which according to the Infinite Crisis rules should not work on Kryptonians that are from another universe. To use the formerly mentioned Superboy Prime as an example, there is no kryptonite originating from his universe, aka from our real world, meaning that the method of fighting him with kryptonite is not an option. That is why he can only be weakened with red sunlight. DC and his writers have actually been ignoring this rule because it makes writing these stories harder. The only thing that can hurt you. Destroyed the last piece on Earth? True, but I've been visiting other Earths. AKA, it's an another aspect of the story moving the characters instead of the characters moving the story. It actually becomes a double-edged sword when applying that aspect's central rules of therefore, over, and then. TLDR. If Superman's ship came from this portal without bringing pieces of planet Krypton along with it, therefore, it is a natural explanation why there is no Kryptonite. However, if Kryptonite from another universe shouldn't work on Kryptonians from a separate universe, therefore, this Kryptonite Lois was able to get from the League of Lois Stronghold Museum shouldn't work on Superman, and neither should their Kryptonite guns. But, because they do work on hurting Superman, we come back to... And then they got kryptonite from an outside universe to hurt Superman with. Also, that League of Loises are hostile against Superman in this show, because they have apparently only come across these evil versions of Superman, as shown in this holographic projector on the kryptonite holding spear. At the end of the first season, we then get a cliffhanger piece of an unnamed villain, whom I assume based on his dialogue to be on another mix of three existing characters. I have found a new planet for you. They have destroyed our ships and closed our portals. It is a planet in rebellion. Let them rebel. It does not matter. In the end, they will. In this case, General Zod, Brainiac, and the Eradicator. That does not make me hold my breath in waiting for the next season, which I also won't expect to take proper look at the flaws that this first season did, and will more than likely keep doubling down on them while pushing the actual good slash intriguing things to the sidelines. In case I end up being wrong, I will be recording myself watching the second season as well and use that footage for my eventual review on it. What else should I still say about my adventure with Superman? Well, the voice acting is not bad from the cast, but the way how the show's pacing is made to be this rushed, it ends up being buried under word salads of speech diarrhea that probably could have been fixed if this first season had more episodes to be paced more moderately. 
That is all I think I have to say anymore about my adventures with Superman's first season. Feel free to write what you thought about the show down in the comment section while also liking or disliking this video. My next videos will be including the comparison review on Under the Hood and its adaptation that got red added to it, as well as moderately length but not too long videos on games that I have been streaming, like the final part 4 of Near Replicant. Subscribe and ding the bell to be alerted when these videos will be coming out, as well as to when I will be doing gameplay streams on those video games for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.